the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Philip Alston, has warned us of a coming climate apartheid because of the extreme inequalities and social tensions that are being created by the most vulnerable people being subjected to forced migration because of climate change. I think that's a very stark warning for us and something that we're only see, beginning to see the extent of and we'll see more as time goes on. Um, and in our HAL day in AGM back, I think it was in December, we called for system change, not climate change. Um, and our panelists are very well placed to speak about this. Um, the challenges we're facing are really cross-cutting and they call for interdisciplinary thinking and a lot of creativity. Um, and so you don't need to hear any more from me. Um, I will go to introduce the speakers, but I would like attendees to keep in mind to post questions. Um, we have left for about 30 minutes at the end of the, of the, of the conference of this panel for you to pose your questions to the speakers. So please do avail of that fantastic opportunity to interact with them and ask them your questions. Um, so our first speaker is Sam Mason. You're very welcome, Sam. Uh, Sam is Public and Commercial Services Union Officer and Coordinator of the Campaign Against Climate Change at Trade Union Group. And Sam will discuss the role of trade unions in transitioning from an economic and political system that exploits workers, migrants and the environment to one which puts the needs of the planet, decent jobs and social justice at the very top of the political agenda. After Sam, we will have Dr. Garold Quinn. Garold, you're very welcome. Um, Garold is Director of the Global Legal Action Network, or GLON for short. GLON works to promote social change through strategic and innovative legal action with challenged states and other powerful actors involved in human rights violations and systemic injustice. In September 2020, Glan supported a group of Portuguese young people in filing a groundbreaking climate change uh, climate case at the European Court of Human Rights, which seeks to hold no less than 33 states accountable for the threat that climate change poses to their lives and futures. And Garrod will discuss the significance of the case and its potential for future legal challenges, focusing on climate change and migration as well as positioning it overall in Glan's um, strategic objectives and their amazing work. Next up, we have Michaela Krumer. Michaela is attorney at Law, a Krumer Law Firm, Austria. Michaela, you're very welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, Michaela's work as a lawyer focuses on the answers that the law provides to the existential issues of our time, such as the protection of the environment, forced migration and the fight against climate crisis. She will discuss the challenges and possibilities for change she encounters as a lawyer working at the intersection of these issues. And finally, we have Paul Pausland. Paul is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and the founder of Lawyers for Nature. Lawyers for Nature is a campaigning organisation that seeks to use the law to protect the natural world and all those who seek to defend it. And a lot of Paul's work at Lawyers for Nature, and he as a barrister, is looking at how we can change the frameworks of the legal system we currently operate in, which is very narrow, um, to grant rights to nature and, and recognise that nature has legal personality in and of itself and should do. Um, but this creates a lot of difficult questions that we need to put our heads together about, such as, does granting nature rights mean we take away from human rights? Um, so we will be discussing all these issues and as I said you're here to hear the panellists not here from me so without any further ado I hand you over to Sam Mason. Thanks Claire, um, I'm just going to share my screen, I've just got a, a short um, presentation which I hope is a bit more interesting than looking at me. Um, I'll just put that on the right setting. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Claire. I just, I just wanted to correct, I am a policy officer at PCS. I'm not a coordinator for the Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group. Um, very honoured to be given that title, but um, we work very closely with the Campaign Against um, Climate Change and are very active with them. So um, it's an easy mistake to make. So my name gets um, brought up there a lot. So I've just got a few slides I'm going to whiz through and hopefully stay within my time. Um, and one, thanks very much for the invitation to speak at the conference and solidarity from my trade union um, for what's been a really important 
um, issue to bring up, I mean, across the whole four panels that you're addressing throughout the course of the day, and I was um, able to sit in the last one, which um, was, was quite in incredible. So I um, feel quite humble to follow on from um, those testimonies and, and stories that we were he hearing about what's actually happening across the, the Mediterranean right now. Um, just to say, we call ourselves in the, the work that we do around climate change, Workers for Climate Justice, and um, unashamedly stole this from some trade union activists in Belgium, um, who actually, which I thought was a really nice title to start reframing about how we talk about climate change and sustainability as a union, but um, within our, our movement as well, because it, it's obviously not just about um, climate change, but for us it's it about an issue of social, economic, environmental and political justice. So there's things we need to do at the workplace level, but more broadly. Um, just to give a little bit of background, PCS has been working around these issues since 2006, but more um, recently in relation to some of the themes of this conference um, in 2017. There's a little advert there for a conference that we supported and helped organise with the campaign against climate change on um, the climate crisis and population displacement. Um, and there was follow-up from that and we've had motions from that and helped support an emergency motion to Public Services International calling for a protocol um, on climate refugees and displacement of populations due to climate change. And this is um, something we're just highlighting here, PCS anti-racism and anti-fascism strategy and kind of what's quite important. We've just revised this and issued a new strategy, which is on our website, the link there, but a very clear reference in it to environmental justice as well. So trying to link up across these issues that it's not just about talking about racism and anti-fascism, but obviously some of the, the, the drivers towards that and obviously around issues of migrant justice as well and how we have to look at what we do within our um, climate change work and how that intersects um, across a number of issues and build the, the links across why it's important. So coming back to why workers for climate justice, um, solidarity, obviously that's a core um, principle of the trade union movement internationally, um, obviously locally and nationally as well. And um, you know, which sometimes see a bit hackneyed phrases, but an injury to one is an injury to all. And I think it's important to remember that. And again, its origins around the turn of the 20th century is, is recognizing that we're not just talking about organized labor when we're talking about our solidarity and what we do as trade unionists and labor activists, but we're talking about unorganized labor, we're talking about migrant workers, we're talking about everybody. And so therefore what happens to one person is something that we all have in common cause. Um, also, because some of you may now be familiar with this term, um, a just transition, which is obviously securing protections for workers and communities as we transition from the fossil fuel economy into decarbonized economy in short. But for us, it's not just about a just transition because it is about justice. And one problem that we have particularly with the just transition phrasing as it stands is that it really is about continuing to promote a green growth model and not really challenging the inherent inequality within the um, capitalist system and which actually are becoming you know, the, the drivers for people displacement, um, migration, refugees, across a whole number of issues. So therefore for us, we need to talk about a just transition in a very different way. And I'm gonna come back to this term a few times as I um, go through the, the presentation. Um, and also it's about um, building our power um, and not just calling for a seat at the table because that's commonly what we call for and why we need to have that within this terminology of social dialogue. Obviously that excludes many people from the, the processes. The other one is equality. Um, and though why so most people think terms like just transition embodies um, issues of equality, what we're talking about here is political equality. So for example, coming back to this injury to one and injury for all, it's about ensuring that organized labor isn't just represented at the seat of the table, that everybody has a right within the political process to um, engage and participate um, in a way which actually the just transition framing at the moment doesn't enable that. And so therefore it gets to rights protections and 
transformations and I think obviously in the from the labor movement side where we have we're fighting particular workers rights we have some of those in, enshrined by law we have many others that we fought for so we might have rights around um, you know leave entitlements holidays entitlements things like this but actually many of our rights are ones which we fought for over um, many decades now um, and also about those protections how we protect those rights But why we need to interesting in the last panel also talking about obviously some of the global legal frameworks and institutions how these are now failing um, particularly around you know for migrant justice and things like this and i think we see the same across the board so here, here's where um we get our sort of um climate justice workers from this was from a climate strike in brussels in february 2019 and these were workers public sector workers on strike and this wonderful slogan which naomi kind um, coined that striking railroad railroad workers are the climate activists of the 21st century so i think that sort of made us start thinking about well actually what does the new climate industrial activism look like and how do we turn our labor movement struggles into ones which are about climate justice and fighting the wider hostile environment. Um, so this industrial activism and some of the things that we've been discussing. So climate strikes, when there was the big global climate strike in September last year, I think threw up some really interesting discussions, particularly in the UK, where we don't have a right to protest strike. And what actually a climate strike in terms of formal industrial action would look like because of course you know many of us were very enthusiastic to participate in this but actually we had no right to do so so how would you actually build an industrial case for that obviously we can have rallies and protests and we promote all these things we support non-violent direct action um, as, as a trade union but i think some of the the more interesting issues perhaps where we haven't had done so much thinking which has just really emerged after the climate strikes of last year was around the legal challenges and litigation that we might start to think about and whistleblowing to start building our links between um, the climate justice agenda and how we can actually build those legal frameworks to to challenge some of this and one area um, as well which we don't really exploit far and far enough is around occupational health and safety um, you know and, and again quite interesting now we're in these covid times but actually occupational health and safety is very much at the root of the whole just transition narrative and where it came from in the united states um, and looking at the impact on, on workers and why should they be having doing dirty jobs that were harm to their health and in um, the, the quite the, the term just transition transition is is given over to a trade union leader in the us who was actually in the oil chemical and automotive um sort of atomic um sector and he was very forthright in linking um the impacts of where there was occupation health and safety impacts of poor health and safety for workers but also on the environment and saying well if if companies can be bailed out um because we need to stop them producing circle chemicals then we should have the same bailout for workers and at the time it was called a super fund for workers but that got transposed into um, just transition as we know the term today but a lot of that was rooted back in what they called the very first environmental strike in the US in 1973 actually against um, Shell Oil Company um, and the health and safety and the, and the lack of rights for, for workers to um, have health and safety rights. And also something else we talk about is building social power. So I've used this term social dialogue, which is, is a common term in the trade union movement about getting a seat at the table with corporations, with governments. But for many of us, we don't think that's enough and actually compromises our position because we don't have the same power at that table. So we have to look at other ways of building our power more widely beyond our um labor movement and alliances so i think the ways um in which we do that is what i call here strategies of, of solidarity um, and really to understand what our responses are to climate change in any way we'd look at any other sort of workplace grievance or mobilization it cannot have any detriment to another group around us 
So we can't look for answers as a response to climate change that then actually impacts on workers in the, the global south. And, and it's quite interesting around the renewables debate at the moment, where obviously the minerals that are required for renewable energy and construction are still extract, extractive um, industries and there's still high levels of exploitation. So now it's very hard to join all the dots around these things, but we have to be thinking about this. But one thing we definitely don't want is any more narrative around British jobs for British workers. And this is something that actually came from the Gordon Brown government back in um, 19, um, 2007 and was uh, tragically picked up by trade unions and oil finery um, dispute um, where they were protesting against the use of foreign migrant labor in construction contracts. And there was actually um, an unofficial walkout of 20,000 workers. But, Sadly, this slogan arose about British jobs for British workers. And I think we have to be really careful in our response to the hat that this is not what we're talking about. And you know, we, we do have some cases, for example, in the offshore wind industry up in Scotland at the moment where contracts haven't been awarded to Scottish factories. They've gone to foreign workers in China where there's huge complaints around this and some which are very legitimate, but we have to make it very clear that our issues are not with those workers in China or Indonesia or anywhere else. This is actually about justice um, for everybody and having solidarity for that. Um, we also have to speak for everyone, but amplify voices rather than saying we're speaking for them. And I think, again, this is something that came out at the end of the last session. It's, I think sometimes, you know, we talk in these they are and one thing that struck out for me last year we had um outsource workers pcs outsource workers at the department for business energy industrial strategy who went on definite strike action um i remember many of those were actually foreign workers who come here and a lot of them were from latin america so we, we profiled a case of one of our reps there from Ecuador who, who talked about obviously the impacts of environmental degradation in his home country and what that meant for him and trying to link the struggles there and with the outsourced workers with actually what's going on more globally. And I think going back to the last thing about building our social power, we have to ensure that we build our alliances and work collectively and again without detriment and understanding um, what that means because we often talk about solidarity but we have to make sure that our solidarity actually means what it says so when we, we sort of have similar arguments in the labor movement around working in the arms manufacturing sector for example our solidarity has to mean that we're not doing things that destroy the, the, the lives or harm the lives of working class peoples in other parts of the world and whether that's building bombs um, to help building the bombs to kill people, uh, main people, and, and creating situations of destitution, refugees and displacement. Um, but we really have to understand what that means. And we've got some fantastic examples in labor movement history of doing that. And sort of more recently of Italian trade unions blocking the shipment of arms to Saudi Arabia in the docks. And, you know, and I think we have to rebuild that solidarity. And it's why it has to remain fundamental to everything we do. And, understanding it within the, the wider issues of the themes of this conference obviously around um, migrant justice as well and the hostile environment just to making sure um, just to finish on one final point I think what often isn't emphasized as well within, within the, the just transition narrative as it arose when Tony Mazaki um, came up with this or thought about this in the US context he realized one thing workers could go two ways they could go to the right because once they get in competition for jobs, et cetera, or we could actually build the alternatives that are gonna give real security, not the hostile security for everybody and alternatives. And let's not make this about you know, competing against others, but actually ensuring our sort of common humanity. And I think we're very much in that situation right now where we don't want to see this in kind of environmental racism and ecological fascism which some are already talking about with some of the solution that we're proposing so i'll just finish there thank you thank you so much sam that's that's a brilliant way to start this panel and you know words that really stood out solidarity just transition making sure that we have a, a climate system that can work for everybody and avoiding things like ecological fascism and racism so that working class people migrants and more vulnerable members of society are not impacted 
but are rather part of the movement and have that seat at the table. So, so thank you very much for that. 